Now for the main event, uh, the uh, speaking for the affirmative, today's school choice movement in the U.S. is worthy of support by libertarians. The affirmative is being taken by Dr. Corey DeAngelis. Corey, please come to the stage. Uh, speaking for the negative, uh, Stefan Kinsella. Uh, uh, Corey, yeah. Uh, Stefan Gonzalez, Stefan, please come to the stage. <laughs> right, uh, Jane, uh, please close the voting. Uh, all of you, uh, 700 people out there, your voting is being closed as well. Uh, Dr. Corey DeAngelis, you have 15 minutes to make your case. Take it away, Corey. Hey, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Look, we have a huge audience here. We got about, what, 100 libertarians here? In other words, we have all the libertarians in New York City that showed up. It's pretty great, right? Uh, I might actually be wrong on that math there. I went to government school, so I don't know if I got that number uh, correct. But thank you guys all for being here. Gene, thank you so much for the uh, introduction. Thanks for inviting me out. Thank you, Soho Forum. Thank you, Reason Foundation, as well, for sponsoring the event. Uh, but Gene, you called me doctor. I got to correct the record really quickly. I'm not a real doctor. I'm more like a Jill Biden doctor. <laughs> I have a PhD in education policy, but uh, so I can't help you with the, the, the important stuff. But I can help you with some math problems sometimes. Uh, but look, uh, I'm here to support the re resolution that uh, today's school choice movement should be supported by libertarians. Uh, and I will say this is a debate that with an opponent that I'm not used to. I'm usually arguing against leftists like Randy Weingarten and the teachers unions and socialists who want to trap kids in failing government schools making the case against school choice. They argue this, this will defund and destroy the public schools. Libertarians might say, yeah, yeah, that, I wish that would happen. Uh, you don't have to sell me on it. I already support school choice is the, is the meme these days. Uh, but look, uh, I actually like my opponent today, Mr. Kinsella. Thank you for showing up as well. It's, it's great to have a, a, a strong opponent in this debate on an important topic as well. But look, we're having a lot of victories on the school choice front over the past few years. It's been a great time to be a school choice advocate. And it's because people like T the Randy Weingarten, the teachers unions, have lobbied the CDC to keep schools closed as long as possible. Why? Because they were able to secure multiple multi-billion dollar ransom payments from taxpayers. They were able to say, uh, well, we, we're, not, we're not open in person, even though the private schools are right down the road, because we don't have enough money. Even though we're already spending over $18,000 per kid in New York City, it's over $35,000 per kid in the government schools. Just give us some more, and we'll open next uh, a little later. It never actually happened. It was a hostage-taking scenario. But the unintended benefit was that families got to see what the heck was going on in the classroom. Families started to see that even ones who had their kids in schools that were A-rated schools by the state, maybe they thought they were great public schools, they weren't as great as they thought they were. Uh, even if they were doing well on math and reading, parents started to see that there was something else going on, another dimension of school quality that's arguably more important than anything that could be captured by a standardized test, which is whether the school's curriculum aligns with families' values. Pretty basic stuff. Vody Bauckham said it best. We cannot continue to send our children to Caesar for their education and be surprised when they come home as Romans. Well, the good news is parents aren't surprised anymore. They've woken up, they're never going back to sleep, and for far too long in K-12 education, the only special interest represented the employees, the adults in the system. But now the kids have a union of their own and they're called parents, they're a new general interest, not really a special interest, and we've had nine states in the past two years alone pass Milton Friedman's vision of universal school choice. What do I mean by that? Arizona and West Virginia were the first states to do so, Ohio being the most recent. Uh, and look, you can take the funding that's meant for educating your child to the government school if you want. You can, uh, it's actually a, pr a fraction of the funding. In Arizona, for example, it's about $7,000 per student. It's the state portion, about half of the total sp uh, spend. And you can take it to the, the public school if you want. If you like your public school, you can keep your public school. 
for real this time, unlike with your doctor. But, but if not, you can take that funding to something called an education savings account that can be used to pay for private school tuition and fees. You can use it for charter schools, for home-based education options like homeschool co-ops, private tutors, uh, micro schools, which the Wall Street Journal just wrote about today. In fact, they had another uh, editorial piece where they pointed out that the, it was, the headline was the teachers union's tiny little enemy. They were referring to Prenda micro schools in Arizona that have sprouted since the introduction of these school choice education savings accounts. And what happened was the union had an opposition research sheet on Prenda micro schools because they're so threatened that their monopoly is, is not going to continue. It's going to crumble before their very eyes, and it actually is uh, over the past few years. But that opposition research sheet leaked to one of my buddies, we went to the Wall Street Journal editorial board, and we got that, that funny headline. I think the picture was a, an elephant that was frightened to death of a, an, a little ant because any ounce of competition is going to shatter their monopoly. And, and good. The main argument from the left is they'll say, this is going to destroy the public school system. But that doesn't actually happen because uh, of competition. 29 studies exist on this topic, and 26 of 29 studies find statistically significant positive effects of private school choice competition on the outcomes in the public schools, too. Whether we like it or not, a lot of people like their public schools. I think it's uh, uh, more of Stockholm syndrome because they're forced to send their kids there. They, they basically have to pay twice in the current scenario. Just imagine if you were assigned to your nearest government grocery store getting government cheese, and in order to, to stop getting poisoned by the government food, you, and in order to go somewhere else, you had to pay twice to, for another grocery store, or get, get this, get up and move to another uh, area that's assigned to a better government grocery store that's probably going to fail in a couple years anyway. That doesn't make any sense at all. We don't do this with any other industry in the United States. But with school choice, that allows for more bottom-up accountability. Families can vote with their feet. And uh, it allows for more uh, equality of opportunity as well, because the most advantaged already have school choice in the sense that they can already pay twice. They can pay for the government schools through the tax system while not using it, and then paying for private school tuition and fees out of pocket. This will allow for more families that didn't have opportunities before to have more uh, uh, educational opportunities. So it's been a great couple of years. It's become a political winner. Anybody watch the midterms? Uh, I don't think the Libertarians won in the midterms, but there, was, there wasn't a, a clear victor in the midterms. People were talking about a red wave, right? There wasn't a red wave, there wasn't a blue wave, but there was a school choice wave. 76% of the candidates supported by my organization, the American Federation for Children and our state affiliates, won their races in 2022. And we didn't just play in the easy ones. We targeted 69 incumbents in state legislature, legislatures for opposing parental rights in education, and we took out 40 of them. It's the hardest thing to do in politics to target incumbents to take out a sitting legislator. And you don't have to take my word for it. Of course, Corey's going to say this about his own organization's track record. Just look in the liberal tears in the New Yorker magazine where the author lamented that, yeah, check this out. Education freedom candidates fared depressingly well in the midterms. Aw. <laughs> Well, those socialists can just go cry harder because also that, although that's bad news for socialists who want to control the minds of other people's children, that is good news for parents who want more of a say in their own kids' education. I better get to the arguments coming from the libertarian perspective that I think uh, I'm going to hear from Stefan Kinsella that I've heard from a, a few other libertarians as well uh, because I don't think they're any good. Uh, but it's basically the way that I summarize it is making perfect the enemy of the good. I think he, uh, uh, the, my opponent and other uh, who's make, who make this argument are coming from a good place. We're both anarcho-capitalists. We agree on the end goal, but I think we disagree on incremental reforms and how uh, we improve uh, how we're doing today. But the main argument is with government shekels comes government shackles. Well, look, if the funding's following the student, you're going to turn the private schools into public schools, and everybody's going to be worse off. It's going to have government controlling all schools, and we're going to be screwed, basically. Well, I think that's making perfect the enemy of the good, and one of the main reasons for that is that we should take the incremental win in the right direction is that the government can already regulate private and home education today, and they have historically. Think about Oregon in 1922. The state outlawed private and home education uh, entirely. You had to send your kid to the government schools. Was that because of a school choice program in Oregon? No, they didn't have any school choice programs. They still don't, and they still outlawed private and home education. Uh, thankfully, three years later, in a Supreme Court case, it's uh, the Pierce versus Society of Sisters, where the court famously ruled, 
the child is not the mere creature of the state, they overturn that bigoted law. But they do so today as well. The government authoritarians in office clamped down on private and homes education. And look where we're at today. In New York City, they were coming after the yeshiva Jewish schools because they were not substantially equivalent to uh, the government schools. Well, the, the, the yeshiva schools responded by saying, well, we don't want to be substantially equivalent. That's why we, we started these private schools, because we want to have a better education than the one being provided. And we want to raise our, raise our children the ways uh, that, that we would like to do so. Uh, and New York has one of the worst homeschooling laws on the books. I'd say the worst if you look at HSLDA's website, the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, the worst uh, uh, homeschooling law in the country. They don't have any private school choice programs in New York City. Uh, but if you look at states like Oklahoma, Iowa, Idaho, which all have universal school choice, what do I mean by universal? Every single family can take their children's state-funded education dollars to the education provider of their choosing, public, private, charter, or home-based education option. And they have the lowest regulation of homeschooling in Oklahoma, Iowa, and Indiana, states that have universal, full-throated school choice. Uh, so in general, states that have more education freedom when it comes to school choice, also have less regulation of home and, and private education as well. And why, what's the reason for that? Look, school choice cuts against the likelihood of government overreach in at least three ways. One, you have fewer kids being indoctrinated in government schools, being taught to like big government policies. They're gonna turn out to be a little socialist to vote for big government later when they're being indoctrinated in government schools. We have over 50 mil, about 50 million students being indoctrinated in government schools today. This is an escape valve, an escape hatch that allows more families to have opportunities uh, which might have more of a free market type of education that aligns with families' values, which is uh, more so with the general public than with the socialists who think big government is the uh, answer to everything. Politics is all about coalitions, and politicians respond to special interests and pressure groups. Well, if you have more people using private and home education through school choice initiatives, you build a bigger coalition to fight back against authoritarian government overreach in the future. Uh, you know, politicians don't respond to logic, they respond to power. Three, you have more people using private and home education, the concept becomes more mainstream. If the concept becomes more mainstream, the rest of society should be less likely to call to regulate it out of existence. It's not some icky thing in the corner that only a few people are doing. Now a lot of people are doing it, and even if they do think it's still an icky thing, now you have a bigger coalition to fight back against those calls for, for regulation from the government. Uh, and so this is an incremental step in the right direction. And look, Thomas Sowell said it best. There are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. The people who are fear-mongering about school choice, a, a thing that we're actually winning on finally, something that we're winning and advancing the ball forward on education freedom, is, um, they, they're, they're make, they, they've made perfect the enemy of good on the other side, but there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. And what the people are fear-mongering are saying is that they're, they're focusing on one potential cost that could happen in the future while ignoring the guaranteed cost of cementing the status quo. And by the way, I, I mentioned Randy Weingarten. She'll never show up to a Soho Forum debate, let's just be honest, right? <laughs> She, she, she disagreed to uh, debating DeSantis pretty recently too, but she'll definitely never do this because they have no good arguments to cement the status quo. But she's made the same fear-mongering argument on Twitter, now X, and she gets ratioed all the time, by the way, on Twitter, now X, um, and she closes her replies all the time. So Elon Musk, don't get rid of blocking, get rid of closing your replies on Twitter, that would be a better alternative. But she's made the argument that this is gonna lead to government overreach in private schools. Is she saying that because she's some anarcho-capitalist libertarian who hates big government overreach? Obviously not. She's saying this, she's a socialist who wants to keep her tra gravy train going and to cement the status quo, force kids, disproportionately low-income kids, to go to their residentially assigned government schools that are failing them. Uh, so look, this is an incremental step in the right direction. We shouldn't make perfect the enemy of the good. We should take the W or else we're gonna be stuck with the L. And look, not all school choice programs are created equal. Look at the law, look at the bill. And the ones that are being proposed today, and that's what I'm defending, today's school choice movement is worthy of our support, are unregulated. They have specific provisions. Look at the Arizona statute, for example. The original statute has specific provisions to say that if you accept the funding, you're not a state actor, you're not a government school, you don't become a government school. The government cannot control your creed, admissions processes, mission, or disciplinary policies, et cetera. They have anti-regulation language built into the law. So I think that's the kind of school choice that we are pushing at American Federation for Children. That's in our model legislation. It's also in the Institute for Justice's uh, model legislation as well. 
Uh, and so that, those are, uh, we, we should make sure to read the bill, and these, these are, are better proposals than, than what we've seen uh, in the past. And oh, th this is all voluntary. As libertarians, we should be on board with things, uh, families making their own individual cost-benefit decisions. There has never been a school choice program in the history of the United States that forces you to take the funding. And if, it, if they did, I'd be against it too. But there is no such program that does so. Every single family can take make the cost-benefit decision for their own children, but as libertarians, we shouldn't, you know, if you don't want to take the money, fine, but you shouldn't look to another libertarian or other fa family, uh, regardless of their political background, and to say, you can't take the money. I know you can't afford to home or private educate your kid, but you can't take that money because I don't want to do it for my own parents. And with these laws, we've also seen a separation between home educators and ESA students. If you accept the funding, you won't be defined as a home educator because of the potential, uh, uh, which hasn't happened before, but there has been the argument that, well, what, what if you don't take the money and you still get the regulation? One, that can happen without school choice, but two, we've built into the model leg legislation as well. If you accept the funding, you're defined as an ESA student, student as opposed to a homeschooler, even if it looks like you're doing the same exact thing that you were doing before to prevent any regulatory spillover from happening. Uh, so I, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, all 100 libertarians in the New York City area. Look, let's not make perfect the enemy of the good. Let's take the incremental victories. I'm with you, I'm an anarcho-capitalist as well, but there aren't any other better solutions. There are some being proposed by Republicans to use state control to have a one-size-fits-all curriculum to ban CRT or to ban other things or to promote uh, American education. I think you're never gonna get out of this mess through, uh, an, and the only way out is through freedom as opposed to force, is to allow families to choose the schools that best align with their own values and meet their kids' needs in other ways. Otherwise, you're forcing everybody into a one-size-fits-all system where you have one group of people, typically not even the majority, a minority, a special interest, the teachers' unions, controlling how to raise other people's children for them. That's in the current status quo, and that's, that you're always gonna be stuck with that problem with top-down solutions where Republicans have, in particular, have uh, tried to, to tweak the system in order to, to, to the better uh, solution is from the bottom up. Allow families to vote with their feet, advance the ball forward with education freedom, and don't force anybody's, your view on anybody else's children. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Corey. Speaking for the negative, uh, Stefan Kinsella. Take it away, Stefan. All right, thank you very much, uh, Corey and Gene. Um, I give up. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, you recorded that, right? <laughs> so there are many ways to explain why intellectual property is illegitimate. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong debate. <laughs> uh, Corey started with a joke, so I had to try. Um, <laughs> He's the expert, so I had to bring notes. <laughs> okay, the resolution is today's school choice movement in the U.S. is worthy of support by libertarians, and I think the way that this is worded unfortunately gives me an advantage in this debate. Okay, to answer the question, we have to understand, number one, what libertarians should support, which requires us to know what libertarianism is, and what today's school choice movement is. So libertarianism is a political philosophy that believes in individual rights to self-ownership, and in private property ownership. We call this the non-aggression principle, or we basically oppose aggression, okay? So libertarians oppose a host of state laws and policies since they themselves commit aggression. So for example, we oppose taxation, war, the drug war, the central bank, and intellectual property. See, it keeps coming up. Um, and another thing almost all libertarians oppose, including Corey, I believe, is public education, which is more properly called government schools or state schools or educational welfare. So why do we oppose public education? I think of it as what I call the three C's. Um, compulsory attendance laws, compulsory financing by taxation, usually property taxes, and government control over the curriculum. So the first two are unjust and unlibertarian because they involve aggression. When you compel people to go to school, that's aggression. When you take money from people by taxes, that's also theft or aggression. And the third, government control is only possible because of the first two. If the government had no ability to force... Let me just a little bit to the study. Okay. To force people into schools or to tax people to fund it, then they wouldn't have any control. There'd be nothing to control. 
And of course, this control results in state propaganda and indoctrination in the public schools. So the kids learn things like be a good citizen, believe in global warming and democracy, sign up for selective service to fight in the state's wars, mask up, vaccinate, and lock down when we say so. Okay? So this predictably results in education that is too expensive, inferior to private schools, and full of indoctrination and state propaganda. So it's no surprise libertarians oppose it. So we oppose public schools and we support eliminating them or reducing it and moving it to a private system. So in short, we support separation of education and state, just like we support separation of church and state. Now, if we had a state subsidized church system in this country, like some countries still do, and like the US actually did for quite a time after the Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791, for example, Massachusetts had a religion called Congregationalism, which is the official religion of Massachusetts, showing that the Bill of Rights didn't limit the states but only the federal government. Um, would libertarians now be arguing for improvements to this system by introducing church choice, or would we be arguing for separation of church and state? I think it's obvious what we would be arguing for. So what libertarians support is reducing the three Cs, get rid of or reduce compulsory attendance, get rid of or reduce school property taxes and funding of educational welfare, and reduce government control, which would be naturally come by reducing the first two. But you have to keep in mind that as long as the government is paying, there will be control. He who pays the piper calls the tune. So what is today's school choice movement, and can we support it? My understanding is it's a broad attempt to improve public education or educational welfare by various means. Vouchers introduced, uh, suggested by Milton Friedman in 1962 in his book, Capitalism and Freedom. And these vouchers can be used to go to another public school, a private school, for homeschooling, for private tutors, and so on. Public choice within the public school system, tax credits, and educational savings accounts or educational scholarship accounts or ESAs, which are tax funded. Now, why should libertarians support this? Do these policies get rid of or reduce the three C's? Well, under, this, under a school choice system, education is still compulsory, so we don't get rid of that one, and it's still funded for by taxes, still funded by taxes, so the two C's are still there. So what about controls? The state still controls the public schools, so there's no reduction in control of public schools in that regard, and I believe the state will have to inevitably put additional conditions on what private schools qualify for state funding. So school choice will increase control. Why, for example, did Hillsdale College have to refuse uh, students who were being funded by government guaranteed loans? But because they were going to be controlled by federal government regulations that they didn't do that. Just a few months ago, as an example, um, this is in the paper recently, the Archdiocese of Portland, Oregon, which runs 15 Catholic schools there, they terminated a department that was insisting on the use of preferred pronouns. Now, you don't have to have an opinion one way or the other on this issue, but you can see that it's contentious. So the archbishop declared that the students in these schools had to be addressed by their birth pronouns instead of their chosen pronouns. Now, of course, this caused an uproar. But if Oregon was funding all the students in this school by a voucher program, Oregon, think of Oregon and Portland, <laughs> would they permit state funding of a school that misgenders students? Would the archbishop have even taken those actions if he thought it might jeopardize school funding? Okay. As for compulsory funding or taxes, in the current system, educational welfare is used by about 80%, 90% of the students. I'm sure Corey knows the number. That's the kids in public schools, whereas 10 or 20% are not using educational welfare. In a completely full-fledged school choice system, everyone's on welfare. So we've expanded it from 80% to 100%. So educational welfare expands under school choice. Now, and what about the cost? Would the cost of educational welfare that taxpayers are compelled to fund, would it go down after expanding it to include private schools and private school students? Well, think about college tuition. Have we seen it go up or go down in, the in recent decades as a result of government taxpayer subsidies by guaranteed student loans, the GI Bill, et cetera? I think it's obvious what happens. And also, the, the term school choice is a little bit misleading. It's like using semantics to argue substance, much like in the abortion debate, where abortion rights advocates couch their position as pro-choice or pro-life. Well, who's against choice? Who's against life? So couching an argument that way doesn't really help get to the substance. 
This is similar to how intellectual property advocates, see this again keeps coming up, uh, refer to patent and copyright as, as a, which are just state grants of monopoly privilege. They call them intellectual property to fool people into thinking they're just another, a normal form of property. So school choice advocates say things like, well, rich people have the choice of sending their kids to private schools. Why shouldn't everyone have that choice? Well, because it requires stealing money from taxpayers and giving it to other parents, that's why. You could say rich people have the choice to buy a BMW. Why shouldn't everyone have that choice? And if I have the choice to send my kid to college, why shouldn't everyone have that choice? Aren't there, aren't there many calls right now for forgiving student loans and for making college free, paid for by the taxpayers? In fact, the school choice ESAs that Corey talks about, they're funded by taxpayer dollars, and they can accumulate money. And here's a quote from, uh, from the page of, uh, of, of the organization Corey's with, unused funds can be saved for future K-12 and college expenses. Okay, so now we have taxpayers effectively subsidizing college too. So it's just the beginning. Where does it end? They also accuse parents of hypocrisy if they send their kids to private schools, but they oppose ex uh, extending educational welfare. Corey says this on a recent Tom Woods show episode 2211 and on a recent Fox News interview criticizing Democrats who oppose school choice, where he said, to them, apparently only rich people should have school choice. Now, I'm not one to be shy about calling Democrats hypocrites, and he's right. <laughs> but parents, um, but the reality here is what we have is we have, we have parents who are forced to pay for other people's kids' propagandized government education and who don't take educational welfare being called hypocrites. I think not taking welfare is a good thing. And even if they're hypocrites, I don't think they're hypocrites. But being a hypocrite is still better than being an educational welfare parasite. We libertarians have long opposed welfare and things like food stamps. Well, vouchers and ESAs are just education stamps. There's nothing libertarian, free market, or pro-freedom about them. Some school choice advocates accuse opponents as Corey did today, not only of hypocrisy, but of being purists or absolutists to oppose even incremental steps in the right direction. They say for us that the perfect is the enemy of the good. I don't think this is accurate. For example, libertarians who support totally abolishing the income tax, like me, we support reducing it as well, since it moves in the right direction and it is an unambiguous improvement. In fact, people that follow me on Twitter and Facebook know that one of my mottos is lower my goddamn taxes. But a tax reform that would lower taxes for some but increase taxes on others could not be supported because it would increase the aggression done to some innocent victims. So we favor incremental steps in the right direction. What would that be for reform of public education? We have to move towards separation of school and state or church or education and state. We have to reduce compulsory attendance laws, reduce compulsory taxpayer funding, not expand it, reduce government control of education. Libertarians support any incremental incremental moves like this, but school choice does none of this. It doesn't phase out educational welfare, it expands it and entrenches it. It doesn't reduce control, it expands state control to private schools. It effectively does turn private schools into public schools. They may remain private in name, just like car businesses in fascist Germany uh, were nominally private, but they were still controlled by the state, and just like a privatized prison is still a prison. So there's another semantic I won't say trick because I think uh, their arguments are in good faith, but there's another semantic argument they use. So for example, in a recent interview, Corey promoted a Texas school choice bill that lets families, quote, access their children's education dollars to take it to the public, private, charter, homeschool-based education option of their choice. And the American Federation of Children, um, his, his, uh, the group he's uh, uh, associated with, supports voucher programs that, quote, allow education dollars to follow the child. Their website says the money doesn't belong to the government schools. Education funding is meant for educating children, not for propping up a particular institution. We should fund students, not systems. But this language, the money, doesn't belong to government schools, nor does it belong to the government, nor does it belong to families who happen to have kids in public schools. It belongs to the taxpayers it was stolen from. Corey says the taxpayer is already funding the education of the child. That same money should follow the child to the education provider that best meets their needs. What do you mean the same money? It's not the same money. It comes from a continual and repeated theft of taxpayers. Why should it be the same? Shouldn't our goal be to reduce this theft so that the amount of money stolen goes down over time instead of being the same and just redirected? So I don't think the money should follow the child. They are no more entitled to the money than the government is. It should follow the taxpayers. 
This debate doesn't ask whether parents of kids in public schools should support public choice. Maybe, maybe they would, maybe they should. But maybe they would also support increasing property taxes to make their public schools better. Just like college students with student loan debt want their loans forgiven. So what? What makes that a libertarian desire that some people want it? In my school district in Houston, Texas, Harris County Independent School District, HISD, um, in Houston with 200,000 students, is the largest in Texas and the eighth largest in the nation. In 2012, a $1.9 billion bond was authorized by the voters. Of course, at my wife's uh, urging, I voted against it, although I don't usually vote. Um, and uh, the local high school near us, Lamar, received $108 million for a new facility, which of course will be paid for out of property taxes. I voted against it and naturally it passed because the majority of parents who, whose kids are in public schools benefit from this welfare redistribution. And did, did it cause Lamar High School to improve? I mean, it does have a nice $108 million building that I look at um, sometimes, but should libertarians support this? No. And maybe Social Security recipients would favor increasing Social Security payments, but do libertarians? This debate also doesn't ask whether school choice might improve public schools, some public schools. Maybe it would improve some public schools, but it might also make some public schools worse. Imagine that you move to a, a good school district and you pay higher property taxes and a higher value for your house, a premium, to send your kids to a good public school. And now with there's, there's, public, there's school choice and you have no automatic right to send your kid there anymore because it's too crowded with applicants and they have to institute a lottery system. And the value of your home plummets because there's, no, there's nothing special about being there anymore. And this idea also would subject private schools to more government control and it would entrench the idea of educational welfare. It would make the separation of school and state less likely. For example, what happens if we suggest abolishing Social Security now? It's the third rail for a reason. You can't touch it once it's, once, it's, once it's put in place. How do Canadians and Europeans react when you suggest getting rid of socialized healthcare system? You know, they, they go crazy. Imagine a world of 100% educational vouchers. How would we ever get rid of it? It would cause private school tuition to increase just as college tuition has increased because of state subsidies. So the question is not whether it might improve some schools, it's whether libertarians should support this school choice movement. I say no. The school choice movement will damage private schools and good public schools, increase educational welfare, and entrench the idea of taxpayer-funded, state-controlled education. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, rebuttal, Corey, you want to take the podium? Yeah. Five minutes, Corey. Excellent points. Thank you so much for bringing all that up. Uh, look, one of the questions that was raised is, shouldn't we reduce the theft? Well, if uh, you pay a little bit of attention to how the school choice programs and bills are actually written, you'd know that this does reduce the, th the theft, and there are 73 studies on the topic. 68 of the 73 studies find that school choice programs, private school choice programs, find uh, taxpayer savings for uh, expansions of school choice. Why is that? Because I mentioned earlier, $18,000 per student is spent in the government-run institutions, and a fraction of that is tied to the student in the form of an education savings account. In Arizona, it was about $7,000 per student. These uh, bills are written at the state level, so it's the state portion of funding, not the local and federal funding. So it's uh, a taxpayer savings, and as 68 of 73 studies have found, and just basic logic, 7,000 is less than 18,000. Uh, it, it should make sense that this does reduce the theft. Um, I, I've heard a couple of other uh, so-called solutions, one of them being let's just eliminate taxes. Uh, uh, you dug into some of my podcasts, I dug into some of your tweets, which is my favorite thing to do. And one of them that you said in June of 2020 was, well, this, is our, this is the solution, make people richer so they can afford good schools, just be rich, let them eat cake. Mar Marianne Antoinette would be proud. Increase, increase online tools and other resources for homeschooling, abolish public schools, abolish taxes. Good luck with that. I mean, I'm, I'm with you, I'm an I'm a, I'm a anarcho-capitalist, but go to us, we have 50 laboratories of democracy in DC, if you wanna call that a, a, democ a laboratory of democracy as well. Have we, uh, have we, in any of those states, gotten to this goal and abolished public schools and gotten rid of taxes altogether? No, we haven't. So the reality is we have a choice set in front of us. Do, are we just gonna screw ourselves and let the teachers unions run rampant and trap our kids in these socialist institutions? Well, they're, they're gonna vote to increase taxes later on if they learn in government schools that big government is the answer to everything? 
The better solution is to have an escape valve, allow people to vote with their feet, and allow parents to choose schools that work for them. Another tweet in that same thread from Kinsella said, I don't have any expectations at all that any of this will happen, the abolishing property taxes and whatnot. I'm a realist, so I choose to make a lot of money so I can buy my way out of this crap. <laughs> good, good for you, but look, we have 50 million kids stuck in the government school system. We, we need to accept the incremental wins. And look, I've heard some arguments from, the other, from some libertarians. It's only a handful, I'll, I'll be honest, where they'll say that, you know, um, this is all just a radical plot for the left to take over the private schools. Well, if that were actually true, and Randy Weingarten actually supports school choice because she wants to control the private schools too. If that were true, why do all the Democrats almost unanimously vote against it? Um, if they really thought that this was their way to control private schools and public schools, you'd think all the Democrats would be voting for it and the teachers unions wouldn't be spending tens of millions of dollars to stop school choice whenever it's passed. They'd be promoting it, not, not going against it. Hillsdale College was brought up earlier. This had to do with federal funds. All of these programs are, deal with state level funding, so this is a federal funding issue. And guess what? Hillsdale College got to say, I'm not taking the money. Sounds, sounds familiar to what I said earlier. You can choose to take the money or not, just like Hillsdale did, and we should uh, allow other people to have that choice as well. Um, so this doesn't increase educational welfare. I meant, mentioned that earlier. It actually decreases it. There's a comparison to food stamps, which I like to use all the time, but this is different from food stamps because in the default scenario with the food stamp analogy, in order for, to buy that analogy, we'd have to be assigned to government-run grocery stores where we get government cheese. Of course, you would ex accept an incremental step in the right direction to instead of having the funding let's say $10,000 per household per year, going to a government uh, uh, cheese provider or grocery store, giving $5,000 per person to spend on private providers of grocery. That's obviously an incremental step in the right direction. So is school choice. We're spending less than we had before and we're not assigned to government institutions to get government cheese or government education. Um, BMW choice, again, we're not assigned to government providers of cars. If we were, I'd rather have a voucher for half the amount to pay for a better car. The government car would probably cost $300,000 as much as a Ferrari or more, and it probably wouldn't run. Just like with education, it doesn't actually, uh, uh, we're not actually educating the kids and it costs a lot more than private school tuition, which is about ten dollars or $12,000 per student. We mentioned, uh, Kinsella mentioned uh, the university analogy that, oh, look, uh, if you subsidize universities, well, the tuition might go. Well, we've had decades of school choice examples and no evidence of this. You'd think there'd be some researcher finding that when there's more school choice, that tuition went up. We don't have any evidence of that. Uh, the burden of proof should be on Kinsella to show it to me. Uh, but look, and the, the theoretical effect on tuition is ambiguous because although subsidization should increase prices, increase demand, Increase in supply because of more providers meeting that demand should it decrease prices and competition should have a, a, a negative effect on prices as well. So we don't know the theoretical effect on price overall. It's ambiguous and there's no evidence that it's increasing it. And even if there was a small increase in, in cost, the overall cost is mathematically going down because we're spending a lot more in the government schools. And this is just one cost outweighed by the huge benefits of giving families choice. All right. Look, those comments were before COVID, so that's no fair. <laughs> the world has changed. <laughs> have you changed your mind? Uh, I'd have to look at that thread. <laughs> but still, just because Kinsella is a jerk doesn't mean libertarians should support this. <laughs> look, Hillsdale is, I think maybe Grove City did this too, but I, as far as I know, Hillsdale is like one out of tens of thousands or thousands of colleges that have done this. So the, the pressure to take free money when parents are clamoring at your door is, is, uh, is uh, hard, to, hard to resist. So it's, it's just ridiculous to say private schools won't accept the, this funding uh, by and large. So over time, it will get entrenched. Um, listen, yeah, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, government-run Mercedes dealerships and grocery stores yet right now. But the logic of educational welfare is that the government needs to fund it because it's an important need, right? But education is not the most important need in life. It's one of many. There's housing, health care, which we, uh, uh, health care, uh, food. And so once you get this in, in place, there's going to be a clamoring for, well, the government's paying for education for everyone because that's an important thing. 
Why shouldn't the government give everyone a voucher for food? And why shouldn't the government give everyone a voucher for housing and transportation and health care? Hell, let's just make it simple. Let's, let's do universal basic income, right? Which also Milton Friedman also recommended with his negative income tax idea. So the end result of this socialized system is to increase socialism, right? So we're going to end up having basically literally communism or socialism from each according to his ability, which is taking money from taxpayers who can afford to pay it, to each according to his need, his fundamental needs, housing, health care, education. So I think that the problem with this is it's, it is going to result in um, an entrenchment of the idea of government supporting people's important needs, including, including education. I don't see that anything about this, although even if it reduced cost in some, in some ways, it would, not, uh, it would not separate school and state. Thank you very much. Okay, we, uh, we now go to the uh, Q&A portion of the evening. And again, uh, to uh, uh, please line up in front of the mic with your questions. And again, uh, I, uh, I will give special attention to questions that come in from those many people who are watching this virtually. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we do have some people at the mic. Uh, please uh, phrase your question, ask a question. No need to identify yourself. And uh, if there's anyone in particular to whom you're going to address the question, name that person. What is your question, sir? This question is for Kinsella. One of the things Milton Friedman did suggest with regard to school vouchers later on in life was that you could index the vouchers to the rate of inflation so that the cost of the, the actual you know, cash value of the uh, voucher would decrease gradually over time. And, he would, and you could allow that people could contribute their own private income to the voucher so that over time the proportion of educational financing at the state and local level that comes from private money versus the state money would decrease and eventually just wither away. Would you be in favor of that in principle? You got the question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, you, you could have that program. And if you actually put it in place, I think it would still have some costs. I think it would, uh, it would end up hurting the independence of the private schools. It would have some bad effects on other public schools. It would centralize it within a state uh, the public school system instead of the, the roughly decentralized system we have now. So I wouldn't say it will be without cost. But if it was reducing taxpayer funding over time, that would be something in its favor. So you could do that. But today's school choice movement, as far as I know, is not arguing for that. They're not saying um, <coughs> it costs 24000 a year for a student. We're going to give them six. And then every year we're going to chop it by 10% until we're done with this thing. And the parents have to come up with a difference. Because the, the greater the shortfall, then the more the clamor is going to be, well, this is only helping the rich because only the rich can come up with a difference. So I think you're going to have the opposite. I mean, what do we have every year with Social Security recipients? They want you to raise their benefits every year because once they're used to an entitlement, they want it to go up, right? And once every private school is taking this, I think their tuition will go up. So then they're, we're going to say, well, we have to uh, – we have to increase the amount of the vouchers. So I, I think vouchers will grow over time once we entrench this idea. But Come. yes, I would be happy if the goal was to lower it, and that was in these bills, saying 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, 2,000, and 10 years were done. Comment from you, Corey. So it looks like you came pretty close to agreeing with the resolution because it's all these programs are tied to a fraction of what is being spent in the government schools, although it's not going down over time, so just to be fair. Uh, but look, libertarians, if, if we're, I, I heard you earlier taking some shots at, at Milton Friedman, if we're going to exclude Milton Friedman from our movement, if we're trying to build coalitions and get things done, we're doomed. If we're, ex if we're excluding people like uh, Milton Friedman from the movement. Question. Yeah, thank you both, gentlemen, for an excellent debate. Really great arguments on both sides. Uh, this is for either of you who want to take it on, but uh, Mr. Kinsella, when he put forth his argument. He gave us a definition of libertarian that is maybe not uh, the entire universe of libertarianism. It's a particular view of libertarianism that might be termed utopian libertarianism because it's, it's basically a view of libertarianism that probably has never existed anywhere in any place at any time. So, so I mean, unless you can show uh, where this view of the world has ever really existed, 
um, you know, the alternative is pragmatic libertarianism, which basically argues that we should have, you know, a policy of freedom first. Uh, you know, so it, is this a serious flaw uh, in Mr. Kinsella's argument that, you know, he hasn't gotten, you know, he hasn't really included the universe of libertarians, many of whom, except, well, we have to accept democracy, right? So we have to accept taxation as in rule of law. Therefore, let's just try to re in expand freedom as much as we can, given the political reality. Um, so Stefan, you, you're the one who got insulted there, but uh, let, let's, let's let, <laughs> let, let, excuse me, let's let, let's let Corey respond for us, and then you can have your say. Go ahead, step uh, a, shot, a short answer, yes. Uh, but now look, yeah, I, I tried to say this in the, in the previous response, this is basically the no true Scotsman fallacy that if we're excluding people like Milton Friedman and saying that even Milton Friedman's a socialist, we're not gonna get anything done. Come on, most, most libertarians are not anarcho-capitalists like, like us two. In order, if we wanna get things done, if we're operating in the political system that we disagree with, uh, even though we disagree with it, we have to build coalitions because politicians respond to power as opposed to logic. So we, we need to have a bigger tent. Yes, we should have some you know, uh, definition of what libertarian is to, to, to be quite expansive, uh, but not too expansive to where we lose our, our mission. Uh, but, but we need to have coalitions in order to uh, advance policies that, that improve freedom. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I just think we have a question about what advances freedom, right? So um, on the Milton Friedman issue, I never read him out of the movement. Um, as an anarcho-capitalist as you are, we're both fellow utopians according to you, um, I'm generous enough to include many status in our movement, or many Minicus, sorry, um, like Milton Friedman. Uh, I just think Milton Friedman is wrong about the negative income tax and about vouchers and about income tax withholding and a few other things, so he's not perfect. That's fine. I'm not reading him out of the movement. Um, as for moving in the right direction, yes, I agree. Well, first of all, you have to define, the debate is about libertarianism, so I had to define what it is. I just simply said libertarians oppose aggression, okay? That's not utopian. That's a normal <coughs> viewpoint, and plenty it doesn't of, even... Plenty of libertarians oh. favored entering World War II. You know, like Ayn yeah. Rand, you know, was in favor of, you know, so aggression is not... Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so they want to reduce aggression, but they're not completely consistent in principle. That's the anarchist point of view. But we're willing to include people that are 90% as part of the movement. That's fine. I simply said our general goal is to reduce aggression and law... I mean, most libertarians do oppose the drug war, war, <laughs> at least confiscatory taxation, uh, and public education. We all oppose that. So the question is simply, given that that's our set of values, which I wasn't here to defend libertarianism, the question is, do libertarians, should they support school choice? So given those values, should they support school choice? And they should only support school choice if school choice results in uh, an improvement of the situation in terms of those values. So that's all. Uh, I have a question from uh, one of our uh, virtual watchers uh, that's clearly addressed to Stefan. Uh, uh, Mr. Kinsella, what if without public funding, half of kids just didn't go to school at all? Is that a problem for you? Well, again, um, I'm assuming that libertarians oppose public education, so I wasn't here to defend public education or to defend abolishing public education. I'm assuming that most libertarians are already against it. So that question is not about whether we should do public education by means of government-run schools or by means of vouchers. That's a different issue. Um, but yes, in, in, my, in my view, uh, uh, we ought to reduce compulsory attendance laws, and if that would re and, and, and make it easier for children to work as well, because you can learn a lot by working, right? Um, so uh, would I have a problem with it? Yes, probably in this world, but I would have a problem with people being poor as well, and I think the solution to that is capitalism, having a rich society and, and charitable people that can help out people who need help. Comment from you, Corey, on that question? Uh, no. Okay. I, uh, I will say E.G. West in Education Compulsion in the State, I believe he uh, wrote that before compulsory funding of education, about 90% of people were already uh, uh, being privately educated anyway. So I think that helps my opponent's argument. But just something I was thinking about. Next question. So you uh, got <laughs> a, a point of agreement between our two debaters. Uh, 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 next question, sir. Uh, th this is for Corey. Uh, you mentioned the ultra-Orthodox yeshivas, and do you feel that the society or the government or society has any responsibility 
to make sure that those children get a secular education or the fact that they don't hmm. and the parents agree to it, is that fine? They're not providing that in the government schools and they're spending $35,000 per student per year in those government schools in New York City. So, I mean, you know, I, I, and I don't, I don't trust the government to be the ones to make that decision. In general, the parents are gonna know and care about their kids more than anybody else, particularly more than bureaucrats sitting in offices hundreds of miles away. But if there's cases of abuse or some you know, obvious aggression on the part of the parent to the child, then the government uh, should step in after the fact uh, as far as a pragmatic solution. But yeah, I don't, I don't think that putting this power into the government's hands is actually gonna lead to the solutions that, that like you have uh, put forward that this is gonna educate the general public and well, the government schools aren't actually doing so that. Except for abuse, you're okay with the status quo. Uh, any uh, comment from you, uh, Stefan, about the shivers, Yish, the Jewish yeshivas in New York City, speaking as a non-Jew? That's out of my expertise. Okay. Uh, I mean, part you. of this is, like the New York Times did an article attacking the yeshiva schools and they said, oh, well, look, they, you know, some of them have zero percent proficiency rates. Well. And then they, they you know, call to basically regulate them. And it's like, okay, well, the government schools, there's tons of them with 0% proficiency with a lot less money, p more money per student. They don't call to shut them down. They call them to give them more money. Oh, we gotta give them $45,000 per student. That'll fix the problems in the government sector. But with the private sector, we gotta shut them down or regulate them to be more like these fantastic government schools next door. But part of the argument for school choice and why we've seen so much success over the past few years has nothing to do with test scores. It's about being able to raise your kids in ways that align with your values. People don't wanna send their kids to government institutions for 13 years without exit options to people that hate them in their way of life. And until we uh, understand that, that schooling is not only about math and reading, I mean, look at Libs of TikTok and the twi uh, Twitter or X account, it, some of the people in the school system see it as a way to control the minds and to raise other people's children. School choice allows some families, particularly lower income families, to get out of that uh, cycle of indoctrination and it has a side benefit as well of allowing for um, those kids to be raised in values that align with their parents, which may be more likely to call for less government regulation when they get up to vo voting age. Yeah, uh, next question, young man, sir, your question. Okay, this is for uh, Dr. DeAngelis, you said that I'm a, I'm a Jill Biden doctor, so. Oh, sorry. Um, you said that, you know, the school of choice vouchers would implement savings because it's only the state's half of the funding that's being redirected. Is there evidence of the taxes of the other half being reduced to reflect this, or is this going into other aspects of the welfare state? Well, it depends on the locality, right? They can continue sending some of that money to the government schools, but they should also, if that does, if that were to be the case, that would, by definition, increase per pupil spending, which should reduce the likelihood of calls for bond measures and other increases in taxes. They'll have less of a leg to stand on. And if you look at how the bills are written, even <coughs> if those schools kept all that other money, which they don't in general, it's a portion of what would have been spent in the government school. Stefan said earlier in his rebuttal that, uh, or maybe it was his opening, that you know, first we're paying for 80% of the families and now we're paying for 100% of the families, isn't that increasing educational welfare? No, because they mathematically put into the bills to make it like, let's say if you have nine out of 10 kids in government schools, 10 you're paying for that you wanted to put, 10% that you weren't paying for before, they would make it 90% or less in order to force a fiscal taxpayer savings. So the, the legislators writing these bills and with our model policy too, we bake into the bill a taxpayer savings and that's why no brainer, we see 68 of 73 studies finding financial benefits of school choice, saving taxpayer money. Comment, Stephen? Well, even if it reduces the cost, I'm not sure if it reduces the taxpayer savings because is there a requirement for the taxpayers to get the refund? Because I know that with the patent office, for example, they make a profit every year off of their government provided monopoly and then the excess profit is diverted into other government programs. I'm sure the post office is the same way when they have a profit. So I can't imagine that if they had a savings, they would just give it back to the taxpayers. I mean, yeah, they could do that or they, they could uh, redirect it to other uh, works, but then that should also put a lower, uh, it, it, you should be less likely to call for more uh, taxation in the future for those other works. But yeah, it depends on the place. Uh, next question. 
Thank you for being here tonight. Um, today, uh, today, average American family can't afford college without um, federal subsidies, and even universities themselves can't afford to refuse it. Um, my question is for Dr. DeAngelis. Um, do you fear that if those uh, normative legislations get passed by either side of the political spectrum that um, it becomes unaffordable for uh, schools to refuse that subsidy because they just can't compete with the price point um, compared to schools that decide to comply with those normative legislations again from either side of the spectrum it's just impossible to compete um, to refuse to be part of the system yeah, I mean this reminds me of something that was said by um, uh, could you oh. uh, I didn't could you could you uh, summarize the question as you understood it for the, for uh, would I be worried about uh, the pressure to accept the funding uh, because uh, it'll alter the market for um, uh, private education in an area so that everybody would be incentivized to take the money, basically? Is, is that your question? Yeah, that it becomes unaffordable to be not part of the, the to refuse the financial aid. Right. So I will say we've had school choice for decades. Actually, we've, we've had the first school choice program in the 1800s, one in Maine and Vermont called town tuitioning programs. So we've had it for over a century, voucher programs. And 31 states plus DC already have some form of private school choice. Nine of them have full-throated school choice. We've seen this movement for decades, and if you're counting from the 1800s for over a century, we haven't seen evidence of this. I mean, if I've, I've done studies looking at the schools that choose to participate in the programs or not, one of them being Louisiana. In Louisiana, only one out of every, uh, out of the three private schools in the area chose to accept the funding. So you still have a, a vast market of non-participating, unregulated private schools, and the other part of this is that supply isn't fixed. You may look at the current supply of private schools and say, well, I don't like any of these private schools, but if you have a voucher in the hand of the parent or an education savings account, well, supply is gonna meet that demand and they'll have different curriculums than the existing options. They'll have, especially with, with home education providers, the education savings accounts, you can use at homeschool co-ops and micro schools, which are really the biggest threat to the, the, the mon monopoly and the, um, um, the, uh, the, the teachers unions, you're still gonna have a vast market of, of providers that don't accept the funding. And again, yeah, this is all voluntary. All the schools can choose to take, take the money. We don't have evidence of all of them of take, taking the money. And um, uh, all the parents have a choice to accept the funding or not. And as libertarians, we should, we should um, be okay with allowing other schools and other parents to make that own, their cost ben benefit decision, especially when the default option is, Instead of allowing parents to take a portion of that money, you're going to tell those parents, well, you got to take all that money, the 18000 send it to the government institutions whether you go there or not. I mean, this is an easy, this is an easy step in the right di direction to take. Uh, comments, Stefan? Yeah. Uh, I, I, sh I was remiss in not mentioning that uh, if either of you want to put a question to the other, you can do so at any time. You want to put a question to Stefan? Go ahead. <clears throat> Okay, so to the best of your ability, if you had to choose one of these two, uh, I asked you this on Twitter, so you might have remembered this one, but it was before the pandemic too, so um, uh, you didn't have a good answer for me then, so maybe you might have changed that uh, today, but no, if you had to prefer one over the other, would you rather have everyone assigned to government-run grocery stores where you have to spend $10,000 per household uh, for every single family, where you have to get the government cheese, or would you rather have food stamps for everybody at, at an amount of $5,000 per household? If you had to choose between the two, which would you prefer? I, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, if, assuming there's still private grocery stores that you can go to that are actually nicer than the government uh, cheese shops, uh, and if I thought that this, this food voucher program would ruin the private grocery stores, I, I, I might have to weigh that against the benefits of the more efficient administration of, of this so food follow, welfare. A follow-up, do, do you think we have food stamps today? Do you think that that has ruined the private grocery uh, stores and uh, changed how they operate? No, but 80% of the country is not on food stamps. Okay, uh, next question. I'm just curious, how, I'm taking it from the other end. How do the schools, the charter schools, select which children uh, who come to present vouchers, uh, which one, how they select which ones to take. How do charter schools select their children, their <laughs> students? Is that the question? Yes? Basically, yes. You'll yeah. Get a lot of people coming. How are the kids chosen? Uh, Stefan, uh, Corey, rather. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, charter schools in general, and the, you know, we haven't seen a lot of the victories on the charter school fronts, but more so ESAs, uh, giving the money directly to the parents to go to private schools. Charter schools are kind of these quasi-public, quasi-private entities, and in most states, they, they have to use random lottery admissions. So when you hear from the teachers unions that they're picking and choosing their students, that it's the school's choice, not the parents' choice, that's actually not the case because they use random lottery. But I think it should be the school's choice, and that's why uh, today's school choice movement is seeing most of the victories on the private school choice front, where they get to keep their disciplinary standards they get to keep their admissions processes and um, it you know there could be a statement of faith uh, as part of the application it, it really depends on the school it could be testing requirements there's a whole host of different ways that uh, private schools could uh, accept or not accept students and I think that should be up to the um, uh, the individual private schools and that's how it is in most places Carmen Stefan? No, I just have a quick question for Corey. Um, my understanding is that at least in some of the, these programs, the way it works out, um, some public schools have to institute a, a lottery because they have too many applicants. So if I'm living next to the good public school that I moved into and I would, had a, basically a right to go to before, now I'm competing with people from outside my district or my county, and so my chance of mo getting into the school is lower. And also I, I've underst I understand that some private schools to accept the, uh, the vouchers have to have some kind of lottery too. Um, or at least, at the very least, it's going to increase the demand for that school. So other parents who were going there before, they're going to have a harder time to get in. Is there anything to that argument? Yeah, so private schools don't have to use a lottery uh, when accepting voucher students. They get to uh, have their admission standards, and that's in our model legislation and also Institute for Justice's model legislation. I, I would have a big problem if, if they had to give up their disciplinary standards and their admissions processes. But to your first question about um, public school choice, that's again, that's not really the big thrust of the victories in today's school choice movement. This is more so, uh, you know, you can, you can, you can choose your your drink at dinner as long as it's a Coke, where you can choose different government schools is basically, it's called open enrollment. And you know, I think that's a step in the right direction too, but to get to your concern is that, uh, one, the district, the receiving district in a lot of these places can choose whether or not to accept that student. And then also, two, um, uh, the, the students who are already assigned to that school get preference, obviously, uh, to, to be able to continue going to the school that they were originally assigned to. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my quick response. Next question. Uh, Sarah, yeah. Assuming that the, um, assuming we get a critical mass of children in private schools, homeschooling, et cetera, such that politicians are incentivized to regulate, and assuming that we have enough government money funding them, that they are incentivized to bow down to the regulations and obey them, couldn't parents use micro-schooling and homeschooling to create so many targets for investigation and unenforcement, or I'm sorry, and enforcement that the regulations are unenforceable, that they can't find the kids? Yes. Uh, sounds like a question for Corey again, yes. Yes, the, Uber, the, the Uber approach, I call it. Yeah. Just do it and see, uh, and they're not going to be able to regulate uh, your, your private and home education providers because there's so much, uh, right? There's not enough enforcement. Uh, and so this is what Uber did, right? Like they would just go into cities and expand, and it's kind of like everybody likes it. You're not going shut to us, shut us down now. So I think uh, you can imagine the same thing happening with, with the micro schools, and I, I think that's why today's school choice movement is so important, whereas the voucher you had to get a ticket to go to a private brick and mortar private school. Well, that doesn't open up the market as much as a, the funding goes to a savings account directed by the parent that can be used at private school if you want, but all these other providers that are lower cost options in the form of micro schools. And this is just another side benefit is you can get more of the money directly to the, to the teachers as opposed to the administrative bloat and you're spending all the money on the fancy buildings and stuff if you have the ESA at a micro school because they can do it out of their own homes in some cases. Most of that money can go directly to the teacher. And, and in fact, Washington Post, it's a trash newspaper for so many reasons, but they had a good article during the pandemic. They outlined a public school teacher that left the government school system after being in it for decades. They spent over, I wanna say 20 or $30,000 per student in New Jersey government schools. And this teacher liked the micro school so much they wrote, they, they wrote an article about her where she was making more money than she was after decades in the government school system had smaller class sizes, five to 10 children, as opposed to 30, 40, and she had a lot less regulation and red tape because she was able to control the school and build the school that she liked. So this is a win-win. It's good for parents, libertarians, students, and teachers as well. Coming Even though it's not good for Randy Weingarten who makes over $500,000 yeah. a year. Uh, next question. 
Yes, this uh, question is for uh, Stephen or Stefan. Um, would you support school choice laws in the case where only parents who are net state taxpayers uh, are allowed to receive vouchers? Uh, that sounds to me like some kind of approximation of a tax credit. And uh, of all the aspects of school choice, I would never, it's going to be hard to get me to oppose any kind of tax break for anyone. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, Cohen, uh, Cohen. just quick response is uh, a lot of these programs, I don't have the statistics off the top of my head, but a ton of states have tax credit scholarships. And so if, we, if you define that as being part of today's school choice movement and some of the recent wins in 2021, and I want to say 2023 as well, are funded through tax credit mechanisms. Uh, right. And basically the way you do it is if you contribute to the, the scholarship granting organization, you get a tax break for doing so, reduces taxes but then those scholarships go to students who apply for the funding. So it's, all, it's still private dollars, and as the Supreme Court ruled in ACSTOV win 2013, private dollars remain private until they enter the tax collector's hands. Um, so I think Stefan might be able to be more on board with something like that. I have a question, a virtual question for, for Corey. Uh, hasn't government funding for college ruined college education, turning it into Indoct on indoctrination camps. Might the same thing happen to elementary and high schools? Yeah, look, I don't have as much expertise on higher education, but the funding of universities, I will say it is over $20,000 per college enrolled student per year, more than what we spend at the K-12 level. And these subsidies, from what I can tell, are not directly to parents who can pick and choose providers or students at the college level. It's a direct subsidy from the government to the uh, higher education provider. So I think the analogy is a little flawed and more subject to government regulation if it's going directly from the government to the school as opposed to, to the parent who then gets to choose uh, different providers. But I, I don't know the evidence on how on how much that has influenced uh, the curriculum at the higher education level, uh, but it is different at the K-12 level, and we don't have any evidence of this kind of government overreach happening. This fear-mongering, if it were to play out, it would have played out by now. We've had these programs for decades. Show me the evidence. Show me where this has happened at the K-12 level instead of resorting to uh, other analogies. Comment, Stefan? No. Uh, f question. Yeah, this question is for Mr. Kinsella. Um, I just feel like maybe, it's a very simple question, but maybe you didn't directly address uh, how, it, if, sorry, your argument seems to me, as, as your opposition said, to be, um, you know, the perfect is, is should, should be the, I'm, I'm phrasing this badly, but how, could you directly address the accusation that your, that, that your uh, proposals are in fact the perfect being the opposite of the good and that incremental change is is uh, preferable over no change? Uh, is that that's Kinsella? Yeah, I can reword it. If uh, yeah, he, you're asking me what's the response to uh, the accusation that which Corey made and which others do that our sort of intransigent position is um, is taking is, is being unwilling to make some incremental improvements or basically letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. In other words, because we really want to abolish all government involvement in, in education. Um, if we don't get 100% of it, we're not, we're not going to be in favor of a 5% improvement. Um, I mean, my response is we just disagree on whether school choice, other than tax credits, but the school choice movement, I mean, if it was just tax credits, you wouldn't have to call it school choice. You would just call it lowering taxes <laughs> and, and, and give, the, give the tax credit to parents, who, people who don't have kids in public schools, too. Extend that tax credit. But um, other, than school other than tax credits, um, the, the disagreement is whether a t school choice would be a move in the, in the positive direction. Like I gave the example earlier of if you favor a 100% reduction in income tax, you would still take 5%, because that's a, an unambiguous movement in the right direction. So I wouldn't oppose that. I don't know of any libertarian who would oppose that, except for the, the, the worse is better crowd who want us uh, uh, to have Mad Max world so that uh, a libertarian phoenix will rise from the ashes, those types. Um, and. Um, but the question is, would, this, would, 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 school, would vouchers um, be an un, unambiguous movement in favor of freedom, right? Which is what libertarians are, it's not whether it would improve public schools, it's whether it would, uh, w whether it would reduce the, the problems we have with public ed education. Would it reduce compulsory attendance? No. Would it reduce com uh, taxpayer financing? I don't think so. So um, just- Come in, Corey. Yeah, just for the sake of argument, because I don't know how many of the programs are tax credits, 
let's say half of them are tax credit scholarships in today's movement. I, I will say in Oklahoma, they just, one of the universal states going all in, passed a tax credit scholarship for all families. Uh, so that's a universal win that is a tax credit. In uh, 2021, we had Missouri had a tax credit scholarship. These are off the top of my head. I'm sure we had a lot more. But let's say half of them were tax credit scholarships. W would it be fair to say that you halfway agree with the argument, the proposal today, because it's today's school choice movement is worthy of support of libertarians. If you support tax credit scholarships and half of those programs are tax credit scholarships, did I get you to move 50% today? I, I would say it would make me less upset with school choice. <laughs> okay. Voters, uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> All right, that, <laughs> that concludes the Q&A section. Again, I uh, want to mention that both debaters will be at the reception afterward, and as you can see, they have both very approachable. Uh, but we now go to the summary portion of the evening. Uh, the affirmative goes first on summary. So, Corey, you have five minutes to summarize your position. I don't think I need to give the five minutes after the response to that last question. Uh, but look, again, thank you guys so much for ha having me out. I will say, uh, I had a lot of thank yous at the beginning of this. I want to thank one more person who's near and dear to my heart. There's been a lot of things that have been going well over the past couple of years. The best thing happened this year. I got married. Thank you, Miranda DeAngelis, for coming out. Uh, but look, the the today's school choice movement is worthy of support by libertarians it's an incremental step in the right direction we shouldn't be making perfect the enemy of the good we shouldn't exclude the likes of milton friedman and others for not being uh, a true scotsman we uh, need to build bigger coalitions have a bigger tent not a smaller one if as a libertarian movement we want to have more success look let's take the w or else we're going to be stuck with the l and what does that mean it means we make our biggest enemies the socialists like randy weingarten super happy they get to keep their gravy train going look if you're on randy weingarten's side on the school choice debate and not mine maybe you're on the wrong side uh, but look, we've had school choice, if, depending on how you look at it, for at least three decades, or if you're looking at the town tuition programs for over a century in the United States, where is the evidence of all these doomsday predictions coming true? It doesn't exist. Uh, Mr. Kinsella is a smart guy. He would have been able to find that evidence of over-regulation of private education at the K-12 level as a response to school choice. I've already convinced them to be supportive of today's movement at least half of the way with the tax credit scholarship victories that we saw, for example, in, in Oklahoma with their universal school choice tax credit scholarship that passed uh, this year. Um, look, the government can already regulate private and home education. They did so in Oregon. In 1922, that wasn't because of school choice. They outlawed private school. They outlawed homeschooling. You had to send your kids to the government indoctrination camps. That was because of authoritarian government overreach. That wasn't because of giving families additional choices in their family's education. That happens in New York today. Worst homeschooling law on the books, according to HSLDA. Massachusetts, no private school. They have one of the worst homeschooling laws in the books as well. You look at Rhode Island, another communist utopia, has another one of the worst homeschooling laws on the books. On the flip side, look at Oklahoma, look at Iowa, look at Indiana. They have universal school choice in all these states, and they have some of the most lax homeschooling laws on the books, according to Homeschool Legal Defense Association. So if you look at states that have more school choice, more freedom in choosing your child's education, you also have more freedom when it comes to home-based education as well. And so let's not make perfect the enemy of the good. That person wants some school choice over here. Thank you very much. Um, but states that have more freedom in, in school choice also have more freedom when it comes to um, uh, uh, homeschooling laws. And I think the reason for this is because school choice it, uh, cuts against the likelihood of those future regulations that we haven't really seen playing out for decades now. I don't think, it, when is it going to come? It's not, it hasn't come yet. It's not going to come anytime soon. I don't think it is. But it, we, we should be... Um, vigilant in fighting against any of those authoritarian re regulations that could be called for in the future. I'm there with you. I'll fight with you against any amendments to try to regulate school choice programs out of existence or to try to dilute them uh, to make them less effective and to make the private schools more like public schools. But if you have more people using private and home education, that means fewer kids in the government indoctrination camps. What does that mean? That means fewer kids being indoctrinated to like big government socialist policies uh, that they'll vote for later on in life. Let's say all you do really do care about is reducing taxes. Well, 
you're more likely to get that in the future if you have kids not being indoctrinated in government schools where they're learning that taxes and government are the answer to everything. If they're being learned in values that are aligned with their families, which is more aligned with not socialism, they'll be more likely to vote to reduce government infringement in the future. If you have a bigger coalition, a broader tent, more people using private and home education through school choice programs, you'll be more effective at fighting against those future authoritarian calls for regulation of private and home education. I'm with you, uh, but the better way to do so is pressure from the bottom. The teachers unions have figured this out for a while. They use their members to lobby to take your rights away. Let's use our members or school choice proponents and parents to fight against those regulations. We can't do that if we don't um, have a coalition to, to fight against those things. If, if more people are using private and home education, the concept is more mainstream. The concept's more mainstream. The rest of society should be less likely to call to regulate it out of existence because it's not just a few icky people in the corner. Um, but look, this reduces educational welfare, if you want to call it that. 68 of 73 studies find school choice program programs save taxpayer money, not in increase it. And uh, look, we've had school choice for decades. The, the, the doomsday scenarios haven't uh, played out. If the Democrats and, uh, really have this weird plot to take over private home education, why aren't they voting for it? Uh, look, let's not overthink this. Let's open a broader tent, bigger coalition. Let's win. We already are. Let's take the W and learn how to do it as libertarians and build a big coalition, not a small one. Thank you guys so much. All right. As I said in the beginning, the worst policies of the modern democratic state are things like taxation, war, the drug war, central, the central bank and the Federal Reserve, intellectual property, and public education. Uh, you can argue about which one does the most damage, taxes, war, the drug war, intellectual property, Federal Reserve, or even public education. Um, so while we want to eliminate or radically reduce all of these, shifting public ed education from one model to the other is not our major concern. So would I be upset if school choice was adopted? As I said, not much. I would be upset if public education wasn't abolished, but if you do it this way as opposed to that way, I'm not that upset by how the government runs its, its, uh, its uh, educational welfare system. And at least it pisses off the right people, teachers unions, Democrats, and advocates of public schools. So, but we need to abolish public schools and educational welfare, but the form in which we provide it is not the main issue. So even though the socialist arguments against school choice are usually bad, doesn't mean that there are not real problems with today's school choice movement in the US. It doesn't mean that it's worthy of support by libertarians. Let's imagine if Milton Friedman had been around at the beginning of public schooling in America and they had never established public schools but simply taxed people and gave every family a voucher they could spend on private school. So now the country has every kid in a nominally private school being funded by taxpayers. There would be no public schools officially and 10 times the number of private schools that exist today, all being funded by the state. It would be educational welfare done by market means. So would the private schools really be private? Would they all not be subject to various government controls? Would there be separation of church of ed education and state? Or would the state be intertwined inextricably with education? Would we expect vouchers to go gradually down over time and finally disappear? Or will we expect it to be entrenched and to grow over time as college tuition continues to bloat due to government subsidies? As for other, as, and as other wel pro welfare programs like social security and socialized medicine become impossible to dislodge once put into place. Would a libertarian be happy with this universal voucher-based educational welfare system or would he oppose it? I think the answer is clear. Supporting school choice ultimately means supporting a system that will at best end up in universal tax-funded voucher-based educational welfare where the private schools have simply become the public schools. So what do we favor? How should we reform our abysmal public school system? Um, in my 2020 comments, I didn't know I was gonna have a debate with Corey, so um, yes, you can't just say abolish government schools and abolish property taxes if you really want to uh, achieve something, but we can do things. Um, our main goal has to be to separate education and state and to reduce or eventually eliminate all state involvement in education. We have to dial back compulsory education requirements, reduce state funding of educational welfare and property taxes. So as I mentioned, I wouldn't be in favor of a school choice program that says every parent gets a very small amount and they can make up the difference, and, but it's gotta go down by 10% every year so that it's gone in 10 years. 
Unfortunately, I think that this is not going to happen with any of the school choice programs. They're going to be put in place, and if they're successful, it's going to be in place forever. They don't want to put in motion a plan that reduces the overall tax burden over time and phases it down to zero. They don't want to eliminate public schools. They just want to improve it. Okay? Instead of agitating to expand the public school system to include and swallow the private school system, instead of agitating to expand the number of students receiving educational welfare, we libertarians should be arguing to reduce the size and scope of government schools, cut their funding, don't expand it, and shift it to cover private schools, defund the government schools, cut school funding, cut property taxes, rinse, wash, and repeat. So for these reasons, I believe today's school choice movement is, in the U.S. is not worthy of support by libertarians. Thank you. Uh, Jane, uh, please open the voting. Uh, again, yes, no, or undecided on the resolution. Today's school choice movement in the U.S. is worthy of support by libertarians. And again, our uh, 700 virtual visitors are probably going to decide the outcome this evening. Uh, but I have in my hand the uh, soul form Tootsie Roll that will go to the winner. I'm going to toss it at him when I get the final vote from Jane. Uh, meanwhile, again, I want to encourage you to attend the food, the drink, the merriment, the, uh, the further intellectual discussion uh, among us and with our two debaters, both of whom will be attending our after party. Uh, follow the crowds. It's 55 Great Jones Street, two blocks uptown from here. Uh, should be easy enough to find. Follow me. I believe Stefan knows where it is. Corey does. St uh, Corey, follow Stefan in this yeah. regard. Okay. And uh, you'll find it. Uh, and uh, that's where we can continue the discussion. Uh, meanwhile, I want to cordially invite you all to our next debate, especially our two debaters, might be interested in a September 18th debate, Monday, September 18th, in this hall, between Yaron Brook and Brian Kaplan, both of whom are well known. Yaron Brook will defend the resolution. Anarcho-capitalism would definitely be a complete disaster for humanity. Uh, <laughs> That will be defended by Yaron Brook and uh, opposed by Brian Kaplan, September 18th in this hall. Uh, Wednesday, uh, uh, that, yeah, Wednesday, Wednesday, October 18th, uh, we again, we do a debate every month. Uh, Wednesday, October 18th, uh, Mark Mills versus Rosario Vertuno. Mark Mills will defend the resolution between now and 2035 electric vehicles in the consumer market will likely disappoint environmentalists by remaining a product bought mainly by the well-heeled minority. Again, between now and 2035, electric vehicles in the consumer market will likely disappoint environmentalists by remaining a product bought mainly by the well-heeled minority. That's Mark Mills defending the resolution against Rosario Fortuno, October 18th, 2023. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this year, of course. Uh, Tuesday, November 14th, we will have a debate with the resolution reading, artificial intelligence poses a threat to the survival of humanity that must be actively addressed. That a resolution will be defended by Susan Schneider, uh, opposed by Jobst Land Grebe. That's November 14th, a debate on artificial intelligence. Sunday, December, December 17th, for the second time only, we're going to uh, do an experiment with a matinee. That will be Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. on December 17th. Uh, and uh, that debate will be, be, be between law professors Kate Klanek versus Jay Bhattacharya. The debate resolution reads, the making of national internet, internet policy was hindered rather than helped by the July 4th federal court ruling that restricted the Biden administration's communications with social 
media platforms. Okay, and that resolution will be defended by law professor Kate Klonick, opposed by Jay Bhattacharya, as many of you know, in that federal court ruling, uh, epidemiolo uh, epidemiologist Jay Bhattacharya, who, who has appeared before um, in this forum, was a, a plaintiff in that particular court ruling of July 4th. Uh, I, uh, I'm uh, looking for Jane. Uh, how are we doing on the voting, uh, Jane? Yeah, oops. Looks as though uh, we need the drum roll, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, again, uh, the, the resolution uh, read, today's school choice movement in the U.S. is worthy of support by libertarians. The yes vote went from 44.9 to 64.3. It picked up 19.4%. Picked up 19.4% of the vote, so that's the number to beat. The no vote went from 10% to 23%. It picked up 13.3%. Pretty close, pretty close, but 19.4 beats 13.3%. Point three, the Tootsie Roll goes to Corey DeAngelis. Thank you both. Thank you both. And please come to our after party, two blocks uptown. See you then.